This video is a quick overview of the American political system and a couple of things to remember when uh, looking at this system is that it's a federal system, of course. Uh, so the national government sovereignty is shared between national government and the states. And it's a presidential system with checks and balances, with separation of powers between these three uh, branches being the judiciary, uh, the president, uh, the executive, and the legislature. Uh, and because of that, uh, the um, uh, lawmaking process is a very slow one, because each of these institutions is more or less equally strong, supposedly to be equally strong. Uh, the point of this is that the American political system is a response to the system of the United Kingdom, which the American founding fathers found was too much power uh, in the hands of the executive, and to uh, um, make sure that the executive would not be able to use that power uh, in a wanton fashion, in, a, in an arbitrary fashion, in a dangerous fashion, uh, uh, these founding fathers wanted to spread power out so that no one institution could um, govern without the approval of the others. And uh, uh, also enabling uh, all three institutions uh, to effectively uh, veto each other if needed. Uh, the result is, uh, as I said, a slow uh, lawmaking process and also one of the weakest states compared with other democracies. And by that, I'm not talking about military power or economic spending power, which of course, uh, both of which uh, the United States has a plenty. Uh, but uh, in terms of the capacity for the federal state to act within its own uh, political system. Uh, so let's go through here. First of all, the judiciary, of course. Uh, the United States Supreme Court, really important for the political system. The court has judi judicial review. An example of this is the DOMA case lately, the Defense of Marriage Act in California that was uh, struck down by the United States Supreme Court as unconstitutional. Uh, it can do that. Uh, it can do that to federal law. It can do that to state law. Um, so it acts as a protector of the Constitution and the constitutional rights uh, and note here that the decision to, to, to enact DOMA was done through a popular referendum. So, so the people who defend DOMA say that uh, the Supreme Court is here um, overriding a democratically uh, taken decision taken by um, the, the people of California democratically. And they're absolutely right. Uh, that's exactly what the Supreme Court can do. Um, so it can, in fact, say that even a uh, decision that has been arrived at through a, a, a democratic voting procedure um, is unacceptable if that decision is in contrast to the Constitution. Interestingly enough, this uh, power of judicial review uh, is a power that was not enumerated in the Constitution but evolved over time. Moving on to uh, the electoral system and the relation between these uh, different bodies, uh, the Congress and the President, the White House. Uh, the electoral system, well, the people vote directly for the House of Representatives and for the Senate. They also vote for the President and uh, they use the first past the post system, uh, just like in Britain. Uh, so um, whoever gains the plurality of votes in, in the election uh, gains uh, the seat in the Senate or the House of Representatives. Uh, the election for president is a little bit more complex because even though the people do vote for the president, the founding fathers uh, felt that there should be a check on democracy. So they invented something called the, the Electoral College. Uh, the idea was that in each state, people vote for a president, presidential candidate, and then the Electoral College um, assembles and they take that popular vote into consideration before deciding who should be the president. Uh, that was the original um, plan for the Electoral College. Uh, today the Electoral College still exists, but it never uh, votes against the election outcomes in the, sep in, 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 in the respective state. Uh, but the existence of the continued existence of the Electoral College has some very interesting effects on presidential uh, on uh, presidential uh, elections. 
So what happens is that uh, this electoral college is still there, and each state has an electoral college, and uh, the number of seats in the electoral college is the number of votes the electoral college has, and uh, the number of seats is equal to the state's total congressional seats, so the House of Representatives plus the Senate, and that's the number. And uh, the presidential candidates need electoral votes to win the presidency, and how they get that depends on state rules. Uh, most states, the absolute majority of states, use kind of a first-past-the-post version of this on election day, meaning that the candidate who wins the plurality of the votes in the state gain all the electoral votes of that state. And this is why you get sometimes election results where one candidate gains the uh, slight majority of the popular vote in the entirety of the United States, but the other candidate wins the electoral votes from the electoral colleges and thus becomes the president. That, this can actually happen here. Um, and the candidate needs those votes to become the president. And that's why you get the map like this um, this is where you have all the number, the electoral votes for each state, uh, and uh, of course uh, the candidates on both sides know that some states are very, very strongly Democrat and others are strongly Republican. So there isn't much point to do uh, much of, of uh, campaigning in those states. So uh, California will go Democrat, and that's 55 votes for them. Texas will go um, uh, Republican, and that's 34 uh, electoral votes for them. Instead, they focus on the so-called swing states, which is particularly those with lots of electoral votes, like Ohio. Uh, with 20, or Florida with 27. Uh, so that's where the real election action is, uh, when both candidates are trying to uh, uh, win those uh, states uh, that tend to go kind of middle. Now, uh, once election is done, uh, there is the relationship between Congress and the presidential executive. Uh, Congress members, the fact that all of these bodies are uh, elected by the people has profound impact on uh, the uh, dynamics between uh, these two bodies. So uh, it doesn't matter how many bills the president wants to get through Congress and how many bills of those fail, the president will not lose office. The president is elected by the people through the system and will not lose power and will not have to leave office. There is no such thing in this system as a non-confidence vote from Congress. Um, there is impeachment, but that's another matter. That's not the same as a non-confidence vote. And that means that Congress members are fairly free, compared certainly to the United Kingdom and many other political systems, fairly free to vote according to their own conscience. They do not have to toe the party line. Now, the party will try to make them vote along the party line. There is something like a party whip. And the president certainly will do his best to try and persuade uh, individual Congress members, and, and they're actually invited to the White House, and they sit down and talk, and he, you know, he'll try to persuade them to vote along his line, and so on. But it's all the power he has; it's to persuade, really. Uh, and uh, Congress uh, members of Congress can then think, you know, take a whole series of, of factors into consideration: the president, the political party, their peers, their constituents, their own ideology. So this is uh, unlike in, in the Westminster system where um, the member of parliament will vote against the wishes of the constituents because otherwise the executive might fall on, on key votes, non-confidence votes, and so on. Here, uh, it's much more likely that a member of Congress will vote like uh, in the way that their constituents want them to vote because, of course, otherwise uh, the member of Congress might not be re-elected. And this, this uh, means that the the president has a real challenge in, in convincing uh, members of Congress to vote according to uh, the presidential agenda. Uh, just quickly, the House of Representatives here, the lower house, kind of equivalent to the House of Commons, uh, each state is represented according to population size, so that's where the, the population uh, is, is um, and represented, if you will. Uh, the Senate uh, is the chamber, the upper chamber, if you will. Uh, this is where the interests of the states uh, uh, is represented. 
uh, and uh, each state has two senators, so they're all equally represented there. So this is regional representation, this is popular representation. Uh, and these are, are uh, fairly equally strong. So in, in the United Kingdom, uh, the House of Lords is much weaker than the House of Commons. Not so here. Uh, so you actually have three checks here. Uh, all of them which can veto each other. Uh, so this is why it becomes such a slow uh, legislative process. Finally, on the bureaucracy, uh, the president uh, does have, of course, is the boss of the federal uh, bureaucracy, makes 4,000 appointments, 1,000 uh, require co Senate confirmation. Uh, and uh, makes a lot of, of appointees into the bureaucracy. And the United States has this uh, spoil system, which means that when the president uh, leaves office, uh, a large segment of the serv civil service does as well, which is also a fairly unique trait in an entrenched democracy, uh, to have so many political appointees in the civil service. Finishing off with some notes on public policy, the United States, uh, of course, uh, provides uh, fewer services than, than other entrenched democracies, but that doesn't mean that there is no um, uh, interventionist state or there is no uh, welfare state uh, functionalities within the federal government. You have health care, of course, Obamacare being uh, a famous topic lately, uh, unemployment compensations and so on and so forth. Uh, two uh, major policies of the last uh, of, of the 20th century deserve special attention here: New Deal and the Great Society, uh, Roosevelt's economic problem uh, program for 36 to 30, 33 to 36, uh, designed to to um, end the Great Depression uh, with the three R's: relief, recovery, and reform. Uh, and Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society program in the mid-1960s to end poverty and racial injustice. Uh, both of these certainly uh, working within the same uh, philosophical groundwork as a welfare state where uh, the state ta it takes on uh, social service delivery. Uh, and that can help explain why Republicans um, uh, argue that uh, the state is doing welfare things in the United States, uh, and they would like that to end, of course, while Democrats are saying that there is no welfare state in the U.S. because the, the activities of the American federal state uh, are li more limited than what goes on in uh, Europe, for instance. So they would like to move the United States in, in a European direction. Uh, so uh, we shouldn't um, assume that there is there are no services, no social services done. There certainly are, uh, but they tend to be less comprehensive than what, what goes on in, in Europe. And that was an overview of the American political system, a federal system, a presidential system with very strong separations of powers and checks and balances uh, that uh, really uh, affects uh, the relationship between uh, the, the different bodies of government. I hope you found that useful.